In this presentation, we are going to consider the teachings of the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, and includes chapters 1 through 6. So let's begin by way of an introduction to the Ephesians. Ephesians is an epistle for all the world, for Jew and Gentile, for husband and wife, for parent and child, for master and servant. It was the mind and will of God in Paul's day. It is the voice of the inspiration in our day. It is an epistle of universal appeal and application. It contains some of Paul's best writing and is a document that deals with fundamentals with the gospel of God in all of its saving glory. From Brother McConkie. The Epistle to the Ephesians reflects great depth in its teachings. Paul's main, theme, Paul's main theme in this epistle can perhaps be best summarized as the setting aside of the things of this world in order to grow in spiritual knowledge and partake of the unity and fellowship of the church. In the passages of Ephesians, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will find many familiar teachings and practices that characterize the Lord's Church in every age. Paul stated that he was a prisoner at the time he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians. So Ephesians may have been written during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome around A.D. 61-63. And perhaps at the same time, he wrote the epistle to, to Philemon and the epistle to the Colossians, which bear, similar, which bear many similarities to Ephesians. During this time, Paul was being held under house arrest, but he had the freedom to receive visitors and teach the gospel. In his letter, Paul addressed Gentile members of the church, see Ephesians 2.11, who were perhaps recent converts, see Ephesians 1.15. He wrote to expand the spiritual horizon of those who were already members. His main purpose were to help those converts grow in their spiritual knowledge of God and the church, to promote unity, particularly between Gentile and Jewish saints and to encourage the saints to withstand the power of evil. Many saints in Ephesians were living righteously enough to be sealed up into eternal life. See Ephesians 1.13. Let's now start with Ephesians chapter 1, Saints Foreordained to Receive the Gospel. Ephesians 1 verse 2, From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Two gods, not one. Since true religion centers in the knowledge of the true God, Paul wisely begins each of his epistles by talking about the Father and the Son. Only when mo men know the true and living God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, who also is God, can their worship lead them to life eternal. See John 17.3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 20, and then chapter 2, verse 6, and chapter 3, verse 10, talk about heavenly places. Ephesians contains the only passages in the New Testament that uses the phrase translated as heavenly places to refer to multiple realms in heaven. In the latter days, the Lord revealed that heaven consists of three realms. You can see that in Doctrine and Covenant, section 76. Elsewhere, Paul wrote about varying degrees of resurrected glory. See 1 Corinthians 15.40-42. And about his experience of being caught up into the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12.2. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 and verse 11, being chosen before the foundation of the world. Verse 4 contains a direct allusion to pre-mortal life, and other verses teach of foreordination. Predestinate is used to translate the Greek prohorizo, if I'm saying that correctly, which has three variations of meaning, to anticipate, to set before, or to cause in advance. There is no negation of agency in the meaning of the term. 
That's usually what predestinate means. You're predestined. There is no agency. You just automatically, this is what's going to happen to you no matter what your behavior is. The traditional Christian definition of predestination is that God predestinates our destination, according to St. Augustine, Calvin, and others. But Paul teaches that foreordination preserves our agency and choice. God can foreordain us to our various callings and assignments in mortality, and he can know in advance our response because of his omniscience, his perfect foreknowledge. He is not guessing, hoping, or expecting. He knows all things. Still, he does not fix our destination beforehand. We are agents and make the choices that will determine our destiny. In essence, we are here not to prove ourselves to God, but to prove ourselves to ourselves. What a great statement. Ephesians 1, 6-8, Redemption Through His Blood. Paul taught that grace, the enabling power to be exalted, is extended by God the Father through His beloved Son, and it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that redemption comes and becomes alive in Christ, through repentance and baptism. See Dr. Covenants 29, 43-44. Ephesians 1, 9 and chapter 3, 3 through 6, what is meant by the term mystery of his will? Both of these sections use that term. The term mystery of his will refers to God's plans that a person can discover and, un, and understand only as they are revealed by God himself. So a mystery of God is just something that has not been revealed yet. Until Joseph Smith went to the grove of trees and saw God the Father and his son Jesus Christ, the Godhead was a mystery. Joseph now gets the mystery revealed to him that God the Father, son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are separate beings. Paul was apparently speaking of the plan of salvation. How God called, elected, and foreordained his chosen saints to receive blessings and honor purity and perfection, sonship and eternal life in that day, and how he would yet in a future day, a day when all gospel dispensations ran into one, call other chosen ones who had been foreordained to receive, by the grace of God, these same glorious blessings, a mystery to the world during times of apostasy. The mysteries of God are those things that are hidden from the world and can only be known by revelation, that is, for ordination, the separate nature of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, yet one in doctrine, principle, the plan of salvation, etc. Ephesians 1 verse 10, the fullness of times. Paul taught that God would gather together in one all things in Christ during the dispensation of the fullness of times. The Bible dictionary teaches a dispensation of the gospel is a period of time in which the Lord has at least one authorized servant on the earth who bears the holy priesthood and the keys and who has a divine commission to dispense the gospel to the inhabitants of the earth. When this occurs, the gospel is revealed anew so that people of that dispensation do not have to depend, basically, on past dispensations for knowledge of the plan of salvation. There have been many gospel dispensations since the beginning. The Bible suggests at least one dispensation identified with Adam, another with Enoch, another with Noah, and so on with Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, and with his apostles in the meridian of time. The dispensation of the fullness of times is a period of restoration and fulfillment of all the plans God proposes and promises that God has revealed since the world began. Joseph Smith taught, quote, taught it, quote, will bring to light the things that have been revealed in all former dispensation, also other things that have not been before revealed. He shall send Elijah the prophet, etc., and restore all things in, re in Christ, end of quote. 
According to the Doctrine and Covenants, it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times, which dispensation is now being beginning to usher in, that a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensation and keys and powers and glories should take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. That's Doctrine and Covenants 128.18. The dispensation of the fullness of times is the final dispensation which will prepare the earth for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Elder B. H. Roberts of the Seventy taught, quote, This is the dispensation of the fullness of times, and we see running into it as mighty streams rush into the ocean all the former dispensations, putting us in touch with them, putting them in touch with us, and we see that God has put but one great purpose in view from the beginning, and that has been the salvation of his children. And now has come the final day, the final dispensation, when truth and light and righteousness must flood the earth. End of quote. This final great dispensation commenced in the spring of 1820 with the appearance of the Father and the Son to Joseph Smith, to whom also the subsequent revelations came pursuant to which the church and kingdom of God on earth was once again established. The keys or presiding authority over this final gospel dispensation rested with Peter, James, and John, and were by them conferred upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in about June of 1829. Thereafter, the Lord said that the gospel revealed through Joseph Smith was given for the last times and for the fullness of times in which the Lord continued, I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11, in whom we have obtained an inheritance meant, in Christ we have gained an inheritance in his earthly kingdom, which is the church, and shall hereafter abide in his heavenly kingdom, which is the celestial kingdom. Being predestined, Paul meant, being foreordained to inherit such. Ephesians 1 13, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise is another name for the Holy Ghost. It is used in reference to the sealing and ratifying power of the Holy Ghost. See Doctrine and Covenants 76, 53, and 132, 7. The Holy Spirit of promise confirms as acceptable to God the righteous acts, ordinances, and covenants of men. The Holy Spirit of promise witnesses to the Father that the saving ordinances have been performed properly and that the covenants associated with them have been kept. The Holy Spirit of promise is kind of like an approve, a seal of approval that is placed upon those ordinances and that they are binding. Those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise receive all that the Father has. All covenants and performances must be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise to have force after this life. So if anything we have performed, brothers and sisters, does not have the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise, will be of none effect in the next life. That could happen because of unrighteousness, that we lose the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. When Paul wrote that the saints had been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1.13, he meant that they had been promised eternal life even though they were still living in mortality. When people are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, the Holy Ghost ratifies them as celestial inheritors even though they are mortal. This doctrine is sometimes referred to as having one's calling election made sure or receiving the second comforter. Ephesians 1.14, the earnest of our inheritance. Paul taught that the gift of the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance. The word earnest here means a token of what is to come. 
In other words, this gift of the Holy Ghost is a foretaste of eternal joy and a promise of eternal life. The gifts of the Spirit also act as a foretaste of the eternal rewards that await the faithful in the next life. So those great feelings and inspiration and experiences we have with the Holy Ghost are just a little taste of what it will be like in exaltation. We are the purchased possession that is bought by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.14. See also 1 Corinthians 6.20. Just as someone buying a piece of property often makes a token payment, sometimes called earnest money in the financial world, to indicate that he or she is acting in good faith and intends to complete the purchase, God gives us the gift of the Holy Ghost and his attendant peace to assure us that he will complete the purchase. God gives us the gift of the Holy Ghost and his attendant peace to assure us that he will ultimately reward us with redemption and exaltation as we live faithfully. Our obedience to God's commandments and ordinances is the way we show God that we desire to receive the blessings of exaltation that he offers to us. Earnest is something of value given to bind a bargain. Here God himself, by giving the ratifying seal of the Spirit, is guaranteeing compliance with his own covenant and promise, the promise of inheritance of eternal life. Ephesians 1.17, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. God stands revealed or he remains forever unknown. There is no way to know God but by revelation. He cannot be discovered by science or found in the laboratory. Man may discover his laws and the manifestations he has left of himself, but God himself, our eternal Father, the holy being who created all things, who governs and upholds the universe, is known only by revelation and only to those whom he reveals himself. You will never find God through the intellect alone. Ephesians 18 through 23. This is chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. The grace and goodness of God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, There is no language to describe the grace and goodness of God. No tongue can utter the praise and adoration due him who created us and who then, through the sacrifice of his son, redeemed us from death and opened the door to us for an inheritance of exaltation in his kingdom. Paul struggles with this problem of proper expression. He speaks of the riches of God's glory, of the exceeding greatness of his power, of Christ ascending above all principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, and above every name and thing that exists on earth and in eternity, of this thereby sitting down on the right hand of God himself, and also of Christ's body, the church, gaining a like eminence with him, and thus also fulfilling all in all. Paul is having a hard, hard time describing what celestial glory is like. But the full significance of all this is beyond mortal comprehension. It can only be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Spirit, which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him, to whom he grants this privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves, that through the power and manifestation of the Spirit, while in the flesh, they may be able to bear his presence in the world of glory. And to God and the Lamb be glory and honor and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Dr. Covenant 76, 116 through 119. What do you learn from these verses about the glory and the status of Jesus Christ? According to verse 22 in chapter 1, what is Jesus Christ's role in the church? Two questions you may want to ponder. 
Ephesians 1, 23, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith describes the Father and the Son as filling all in all, because the Son, having overcome, has received a fullness of the glory of the Father and possesses the same mind with the Father. Then he announces the conclusion to which Paul here only alludes. And all those who keep his commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even the express image of him who fills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory and becoming and become one in him, even as the Father Son and Holy Spirit are one. That's Lectures on Faith, pages 50 through 51. Ephesians chapter 2, we are saved by grace through faith. By way of introduction, Elder Bruce R. McConkey writes, Salvation in all its forms, kinds, and degrees comes by the grace of God. That is, because of his love, mercy, and condescension, God our Father ordained the plan and the system of salvation which would bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Pursuant to this plan, he sent his only begotten Son into the world to work out the infinite and eternal atoning sacrifice. Then our Lord, in turn, also because of his love, mercy, and condescension, perform the appointed labor so that all men are raised in immortality, and those who believe and obey the gospel law inherit eternal life. Doctrine and Covenants 29, 43-44. The faithful gain a forgiveness of their sins and are reconciled to God because they believe and obey His laws. Men are thus saved by grace alone in the sense of being resurrected. They are saved by grace coupled with obedience in the sense of gaining eternal life or exaltation. The gospel plan is to save men in the celestial kingdom. And hence Paul teaches salvation by grace through faith, through obedience, through accepting Christ, through keeping the commandments. Thus Nephi writes, Be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. 2 Nephi 25, 23. And Moroni records, Come unto Christ and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfected in Christ. When it comes down to it, brothers and sisters, no matter what we do, it will only be because of the grace of Christ that we are saved and perfected in him. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Faith, grace, and obedience. Chapter 2, verse 1. You hath he quickened. Paul was meaning, you are born again. You have received the Holy Ghost. You are alive in Christ. You are members of the church. You are under covenant to keep the commandments and work the works of righteousness. Chapter 2, verse 2, Prince of Power of the Air. Paul is referring to Satan, an idiomatic expression indicating Satan's rule and dominance in this world in, as it were, the very air around us. The phrase children obedience, Paul meant those who walk after the manner of the world, who are carnal, sensual, sensual, devilish, and who are subject to the lusts of the flesh. Chapter 2, verse 3. By nature, the children of wrath, Paul meant, man by nature is subject to the lusts and appetites of mortality, and so remains until he crucifies the flesh and becomes a new creature in Christ. For the natural man is an enemy of God, and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, 
willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth to inflict upon him, even as doth as a child does submit to his father. Mosiah 3.19 Chapter 2, verse 4, mercy, love, meaning elements of grace. Chapter 2, verse 5, when we were dead in sin, Paul means before we joined the church and were baptized for the remission of sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, meaning hath made us new creatures of the Holy Ghost, so that we are now born again and have become alive in Christ. By grace ye are saved, Paul meant, how else could salvation come? Can man save himself? Can he resurrect himself? Can he create a celestial kingdom and decree his own admission thereto? Salvation must and does originate with God, and if man is to receive it, God must bestow it upon him, which bestowal is a manifestation of his grace. Chapter 2, verse 6, in heavenly places, meaning in the celestial kingdom. Chapter 2, verse 7, through Christ Jesus, Paul meant, the proof that God the Father loves us is shown in his willingness to send his only begotten Son to work out the infinite atonement which caused even God, meaning Jesus Christ, the greatest of all, to tremble because of the pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. Doctrine and Covenants 19, 18 through 19. It's hard to comprehend that type of suffering the Savior went through. I do not comprehend it, but I sure appreciate it. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you are saved through faith unto good works. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, Paul discusses the relationship between faith, I'm sorry, grace, faith, and good works. Ultimately, salvation comes through the merits of Jesus Christ's work, not on our own. Paul called followers of Jesus Christ God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, see Ephesians 2.10. This places emphasis on the Lord's work rather than on our own and teaches that our ability to perform good works stems from the change that the grace of Jesus Christ causes to take place within us when we turn to him in faith. Paul taught that we are not saved by either faith or works alone, as both are critical to salvation. Faith and works empower us to receive the merciful blessings of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained, Salvation in all its forms, kinds, and degrees comes by the grace of God. That is, because of his love, mercy, and condescension, God our Father ordained the plan and system of salvation which would bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Pursuant to this plan, he sent his only begotten Son into the world to work out the infant and eternal atoning sacrifice. Men are thus saved by grace alone in the sense of being resurrected. They are saved by grace coupled with obedience in the sense of gaining eternal life. The gospel plan is to save men in the celestial kingdom, and hence Paul teaches salvation by grace through faith, through obedience, through accepting Christ, through keeping the commandments. Thus Nephi writes, be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. And Moroni records, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your mind and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you that by his grace you may be perfected in Christ. As you can see, we have gone over that twice now, showing the importance of that. 
D. Kelly Ogden and Andrew Skinner, who are professors at BYU of ancient scripture, also write, Ultimately, all are saved by grace. Works cannot save us, but our obedience to God's commandments cannot be ignored. Paul taught that we are saved not by faith alone, nor by works alone. There must be a balance. The grace versus works controversy is, as C.S. Lewis once commented, like asking which blade in a pair of scissors is more necessary. Faith and works are two sides of the same coin. The emphasis is not going to the extreme with either, but on with either on, but maintaining balance. Chapter 2, verse 9, not of works. Romans 10, 9 seemingly teaches the same doctrine as that taught in these verse, in this verse. A spirit body, physical body, resurrection, forgiveness, and the atonement are unearned gifts of grace bestowed by God's loving kindness. Despite our belief that when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to the law, law upon which it is predicated, it is true that we do not earn or deserve every blessing that comes to us. Ephesians 2, 11-13, Uncircumcision and Circumcision The term uncircumcision referred to the Gentiles and circumcision referred to the Jews. In Ephesians 2, verses 12-13, Paul emphasized the separation that had existed between the Gentiles and God prior to the time of Jesus Christ. The Gentiles had been without Christ, without Christ in the world and were aliens and strangers, meaning they were not part of Israel and had not entered into covenant with God, having no hope without the light of the gospel. But now that they had entered into the gospel covenant with Jesus Christ, Gentiles who once far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. They can now become close to Christ and come into his gospel. Ephesians 2.14 hath broken down the middle wall of part partition, perhaps an allusion to the warning barrier which marked off the court of the Gentiles from the high, higher level of the court of the woman in the temple. It was death for a Gentile to, to pass the barrier. Thus, even as that wall, now rejected of God, no longer separated Jews and Gentiles, so no gospel blessings available to the Jews are withheld from the Gentiles. So once the law of Moses was done, that barrier, that veil which was placed on the Temple Mount has now been done away with. Both Jew and Gentile may enter. Ephesians 2, verses 15 through 17. Verse 15, the fall of man introduced discord between God and man and between man and man. The law revealed this discord. Christ in his humanity fulfilled the law for man and set an example of perfect obedience. His humanity united all mankind. His obedience united mankind to God. Verse 16 is a paradox. The slain slays and a bloody death which commonly provokes enmity, slays it. Verse 17, Paul is saying, rejoicing greatly in repetition of peace. In Ephesians 2, 12 through 19, Paul spoke about the wall of partition, meaning the spiritual barrier that separated Jews from Gentiles and also separated Gentiles from God. These and all other barriers were removed by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Gentiles who accepted the gospel were no longer to be regarded as aliens, strangers, and foreigners. They were now of the household of God, part of God's covenant people. By accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ through faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost, both Jewish and Gentile members of the church had access to God. See Ephesians 2.18. In modern times, we enjoy the same blessings when we are baptized and live worthily. The walls between us and the Lord are removed and we gain full access to God's blessings. We also become members of the household of God. 
Ephesians 2, 20-22, the foundation of apostles and prophets. The foundation of the church of Jesus Christ is apostles and prophets, one unmistakable evidence of his true church. If there are no apostles and prophets given divine authority directly through Christ's servants or through Christ himself, then there is not the true church. It's a church man made by man. And he himself is the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone is the massive stone at the foundation corner that provides stability and strength for the structure and serves as a guide for all, all other foundation stones. In Christ, Jew and Gentile are bound together to create one unified people. The chief cornerstone of the church is Jesus Christ. Apostles and prophets constitute the remainder of its authorized foundation. The superstructure of lesser authorities cannot viably rest upon any other foundation. Paul used this imagery to explain that Jesus Christ provides strength and stability to the whole church and that through Jesus Christ, Jewish and Gentile members of the church are bound together. All members become unified, fitly framed together, growing unto an unholy temple in the Lord. All of this is made possible through the atonement of Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discussed why a foundation of apostles and prophets is critical to the church. Quote, the apostolic and prophetic foundation of the church was to bless in all times, but especially in times of adversity or danger, times when we might feel like children, confused or disoriented, perhaps a little fearful, times in which the devious hand of men or the maliciousness of the devil would attempt to unsettle or mislead. In New Testament times, in Book of Mormon times, and in modern times, these officers form the foundation stones of the true church, positioned around and gaining their strength from the chief cornerstone, the rock of our Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Such a foundation in Christ was and is always to be a protection in days when the devil, when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, when all his hell and his mighty storms shall beat upon you. End of quote. Chapter 3. Gentiles are fellow heirs with Israel. Ephesians 3, 1 through 17, the mystery of Christ. Paul wrote about the dispensation of the grace of God is an outpouring by direct revelation to an individual of knowledge of the grace and goodness of God in making salvation available through Jesus Christ. 3 verse 2, and how the mystery of Christ that had been revealed to him, Ephesians 3, 4. Here mystery refers to a sacred truth made known by revelation. The mystery Paul wrote about is that both Jew and Gentiles can become heirs of the gospel covenant through Christ. This was a doctrine that in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Though prophets in former ages had known that the gospel would go to the Gentiles, this knowledge was now coming with greater clarity and perfection to the living apostles and prophets in the church. Similarly, Though ancient prophets knew of the restoration of the gospel in the latter days, inspired persons in the church today have a more perfect knowledge of what is actually taking place as a part of that restoration because they are participants in it. The apostle of the Gentile enlarges on the greatness of his special mission. Thrice here he calls it a grace given to him. The unsearchable riches of Christ, Paul meant, the incomprehensible and thus inexplorable blessings available because of Christ and his atoning sacrifice, including those things which surpasses all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion. Now that the gospel is going to the Gentiles, everyone can see that it is for all men, while those who accept it shall also know of heavenly things. 
In Ephesians 3, 11 through 12, Paul taught that through Jesus Christ and our faith in him, we can have boldness and access to God with confidence. See Ephesians 2, 18. The word boldness can be understood as confidence in the presence of God. Because of the Savior in this life, we can freely approach God the Father through prayer and in the name of Jesus Christ. And in the next life, we can enter God's presence with confidence. Ephesians 3, 13, that ye faint not, Paul meant, it might mean that I may not faint. But Paul is not afraid of losing heart. He rejoiced in tribulations, Romans 5, 3, and took pleasure in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. He is afraid that the Gentiles may lose heart when they see him persecuted for helping them. They ought rather to glory in this. Paul pays tribute to the Father and bows the knee because of their union with the Jews in Christ. Paul taught that all those who follow Christ take upon themselves his name and become his seed and heirs of his kingdom, just as the Book of Mormon teaches. See Mosiah 15.11 and Mosiah 27.25. These teachings are evidence of Paul's sincerity and humility. May they have great spiritual power. May Christ dwell in their hearts to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man and being filled up to the measure of God's fullness. His prayer for the Ephesian saints was that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith and that they would come to know the love of Christ. Ephesians 3.17, Rooted and Grounded. Elder Neil A. Maxwell stated the following of the importance of being rooted and grounded in Christ. Quote, All of our legitimate and deepest needs can be met, but only through obedience to the commandments of God. Being grounded, rooted, established, and settled means understanding that central reality. Besides, is there any recognition greater than his recognition of his followers as his friends? Is there any security to exceed that of living with him in mansions that he has lovingly prepared for us? Is there any better belonging than being in his presence forever and ever? Is there any greater identity that we can know than being a righteous daughter, a son of God? And just to pause for a minute, that is the identity we should focus on. Not, not on sexual identity, gender identity, and all the other crazy identities this world is making up through Satan. The identity that we are righteous sons and daughters of God. Back to his quote. Are there any promises of adventure greater than his assurance to us about wider and everlasting opportunities for service that await us? Is there any better way to overcome loneliness than to lose ourselves in his service? If we are settled, we will possess such perspective, and the heat of the day will not cause us to faint and become disoriented. So it is that in this life, which is such a brief but very thorough proving ground, the gospel truths are vital. Do we really believe in these and in ourselves enough to apply them? Are we sufficiently settled to see things as they really are? Yet another subtle but vital benefit of being grounded, rooted, established, and settled is that time can work for us. When things are in place, what must happen in process of time can most efficiently occur. When, on the other hand, we are unsettled and drifting as to our beliefs and, and or behavior, time is our enemy. Its relentless passage is an unnerving reminder. We, when we are not rooted, we feel the heat of the sun quickly and start throwing off that which seems to be disposable in order to be comfortable. Debts are repudiated. Relatives go unacknowledged. Even spouses and children seem to become an extra burden in the heat. The very scorch, scorching makes us think more and more of our own thirst and less and less of the discomforts of others, setting in motion an awful cycle with selfishness. 
Each self-serving step seems to compel another until safety barriers are passed beyond which the victim never really intended to go. I didn't want to break up my family. I just needed someone to understand me. We needed the money for the family, and the extra job made sense at the time. Now the reason for the extra money has fallen apart. The church calling just didn't fit into my schedule, and now I wonder if the church can ever meet my needs. To accelerate our becoming more settled spiritually of what might there be more. More time, for instance, to visit the sick, including those in hospitals. Meekly done, it is a help to them and to us, since the blessing of good health is barely noticed when we are cumbered with driving on the freeway. Performing the simplest bodily functions and enjoying a good night's sleep are, ironically, taken for granted by us, even as God gives them to us day by day. Short stays in and short visits to hospitals can deepen our appreciation. Besides, how many places does one see as much patience as among sensitive doctors, nurses, and orderlies? Or more gratitude than among the sick who mending can barely contain their gladness? Hospitals can put things in focus and can a walk in the, as can a walk in the woods. Finally, as we become grounded, rooted, established, settled, we can stay settled whether, in, whether life is unwantedly prolonged or is expectedly terminated. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. Ephesians 3, 18-21, verse 18, may have strength to comprehend what is really incomprehensible. The four dimensions represent the vastness of the love of Christ towards us. Verse 19, Paul was saying an audacious paradox, that ye may be filled up to all the fullness of God, that is, to the perfection of the divine attributes. Verse 20, Paul meant the doxology, meaning a hymn in praise of the Almighty, explains the audacity of the prayer. God can give us superabundantly quiet, inconceivable gifts. Verse 21, the phrase in the church by Christ Jesus, meaning the church in this epistle is always the church universal, never a local church. This church completes the, completes the Christ, reveals God's wisdom to angels, is with Christ the sphere in which God is glorified. It is indeed a glorious church. Those who love Christ is signified the same by keeping his commandments, advance and progress until they gain the fullness of the Father, until they know what he knows, possesses the character and perfections and attributes embodied in him, have all power, might, and dominion as he does, and thereby fulfill the commandments to be perfect even as he is perfect. Chapter 4, Ephesians 4, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. By way of introduction, Elder McConkie again writes, There is no more self-evident truth in this world. There is nothing in all eternity more obvious than that there can, is and can be only one true church. A true church does not create itself any more than man creates God or resurrects himself or establishes his for himself a celestial heaven. All churches may be false, but only one can be true, simply because religion comes from God and God is not the author of confusion. Truth is only one thing, and every truth is in harmony with every other truth. If one church proclaims that God is an exalted man and another says he is an incorporeal spirit essence, if one church teaches that baptism is essential to salvation and another considers it of no importance whatsoever, if one church says salvation consists in the continuation of the family unit in eternity and another affirms there is no marrying or given in marriage in heaven and so on and so on, to a thousand gospel doctrines something is wrong with somebody's religious views. There 
Just as there is only one true science or one true mathematics, so there is one true God, one true church, one true gospel, and one true baptism, one true celestial marriage, and on and on. When the Lord restored the gospel and set up his church in modern times, naming it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, by his own voice he described it as the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. Doctrine and Covenants 130. In contrast, all other churches are man-made, which accords with the instructions given the prophet in the first vision, that he must join none of them, for they were all wrong. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, unity of the faith. The word one appears seven times in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Oneness and unity are important themes in Ephesians and in Paul's other writings. Paul constantly preached about unity and prayed for unity among church members. In modern times, the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith that unity is a key law in the celestial kingdom. See Doctrine and Covenants 105, 3 through 5. There is only one true Lord, one true faith, one true baptism, and one true Father of all, built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Elder Delbert L. Stapley of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the critical role apostles play in maintaining unity and pure doctrine. Quote, After Jesus put his apostles in charge of the church anciently, they preached the same doctrine, unity of doctrine and practiced the same ordinances which Jesus Christ had given them. As long as they remained on the earth, functioning under the authority Jesus gave them, unity of doctrine and uniformity of the ordinances prevailed. The gospel message which they were commanded to take to all the world was the same to everyone everywhere. People were not taught different Gospels and then given a choice. There was only one plan for all. Because of the universality of these requirements for salvation, the Apostle Paul wrote, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One church, one authorized ministry, one orthodox gospel doctrine, and one Holy Ghost characterized the church of Jesus Christ in his time. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Thus God's revelation to leaders of the church of Jesus Christ was reasonable, consistent, and unified. It was only after the death of Christ's apostles that revelation ceased. The pure doctrines Christ taught became diluted with the philosophy of the world, and profane innovations appeared in the ordinances of the church. Eventually, that which had once been clear and understandable became mythical and confusion. End of quotation. Chapter 4, verse 1. Living the gospel, seeking righteousness, pursuing truth. These are vocations, not advocations. They are the true occupations and businesses of the saints, as distinguished from their temporal pursuits and businesses, which are of lesser importance. Chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Paul consistently preached and prayed for unity among the church members in loneliness and meekness, meaning voluntary humility, and with long-suffering, exercising patience and indulgence in love towards those who injure us. There is only one true Lord, not many, one true faith, one true religion, and plan of salvation, one true course back to the presence of God, not man. Unlike the current belief of many Christians, baptism and membership in the true church of Jesus Christ are necessary for the salvation in the fullest sense. One true spirit, even the Holy Ghost, one true baptism, and one true Father of all. The phrase, who is above all and through all and in you all, Paul meant, whose influence, because he is God above all, is everywhere. God, who sitteth upon his, this throne, comprehendeth all things, and all things are before him, and all things are round about him, and he is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him, and of him, even God, forever and ever. No wonder he knows how to save us and to help us. Chapter 4, verse 7. 
all men receive blessings from the Lord of one degree or, or kind or another, according to the prophetic promises that when he overcome death and ascended again to heaven, he would give gifts unto men, especially gift of grace. Among these gifts are the officers of his church who guide men to salvation. Ephesians 4, verse 8, Jesus led captivity captive. Paul said that when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, he led captivity captive. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained the meaning of this phrase. Jesus Christ overcame death. All men were the captives of death until Christ captured the captivator and made death subject to him. Or as the psalm from which Paul is quoting continues to say, He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. Ephesians 4, 9-10 through 10, Paul is saying Christ descended from heaven to live on earth, to undergo his own mortal probation, and to work out the infinite and eternal atonement. He even descended into the spirit prison where he preached to the captive spirits. But now he has ascended into the heaven to glorify his Father, who is God above all. Verse 10, all heavens, meaning there are many heavens with God the Father supreme over them all. Ephesians 4, chapter 4, verse 11, who are evangelists and pastors. Paul listed the offices of evangelist and pastor as part of the organizational structure of the church. An evangelist is one who bears or proclaims the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Latter-day Revelation, patriarchs are described as being evan evangelical ministers. That's Doctrine and Covenants 107, 39-41. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, an evangelist is a patriarch. Whether the church of Christ is established in the earth, there should be a patriarch for the benefit of the posterity of the saints, as it was with Jacob in giving his patriarchal blessings to his sons, end of quote. A pastor is a shepherd or one who leads the flock, a fitting description of modern day bishops, branch presidents, and stake and district presidents. Ephesians 4, chapters 12 through 14, the unity of the faith. 4 verse 12, Paul was saying the officers and leaders that Paul listed as the heads of the church of Jesus Christ are still needed today. Paul reasons that we need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and other, others because the saints are not yet perfected. Moreover, the work of the ministry is not yet accomplished. The body of Christ is not yet wholly edified. Without living apostles and prophets, the members of the church would not be enlightened from on high or taught what the Lord would have them know. Why? Because they make known the true doctrines of salvation, and they confer or authorize the conferral of the Holy Ghost, without whose enlightening power none can comprehend the things of pure religion. So if new doctrine is taught by anyone other than the first presidency and the twelve, it is false doctrine. Chapter 4, verse 13, we have not yet come to a unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son, or to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, meaning the stature of glory and exalt exaltation enjoyed by Christ himself. The whole plan of salvation is designed to enable men to become like God. Those who gain infinite perfection shall be like Christ, and he is like the Father. As Joseph Smith said, quote, Salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it by himself or one like him. End of quotation. Lectures on Faith, pages 63 to 67. Thus leading us to the fullness of Christ. Christ received the fullness of the glory of the Father, and he received all power both in heaven and on earth, and the glory of the Father was with him, for he dwelt in him. Chapter 4, verse 14, Paul is saying, And we are still children carried about with every wind of doctrine. 
Until these objectives are reached, we still need more leaders to show us the way. Unless there are apostles and prophets to guide God's church, its members being thus without revelation from on high and driven by the winds of doubt and uncertainty are soon drowned in the sea of apostasy. President Russell M. Nelson quoted Paul's teachings on the unity of the faith and then explained, quote, The ministry of the apostles, the first presidency in the twelve, is to bring about that unity of the faith and to proclaim our knowledge of the Master. Our ministry is to bless the lives of all who will learn and follow the more excellent way of the Lord. And we are to help people prepare their potential salvation and exaltation. End of quote. Elder, T, Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles similarly provided insight into the unifying role of apostles. Quote, In the church today, just as anciently, establishing the doctrine of Christ or the doctrinal deviations is a matter of divine revelation to those the Lord endows with apostolic authority. End of quote. In verse 12, the term saints is mentioned. Saints, or holy ones, is used to translate Kedushim ten times and Chesedim nineteen times in the Old Testament. All these terms translated saints mean holy ones, which means set apart for a specific purpose. The intent is that the members of the church are to become a holy people with the purpose or intent of reaching exaltation. The term is no way conveys aloofness from sin or any suggestion of superiority over other people. Saints are members of the Lord's church who are trying to become holy again for the purpose of being exalted. Ephesians 4, 15-19 Verse 15, Paul is saying, But with apostles and prophets, the saints, being thus guided by God, increase in spiritual things until they become like Christ their head. Verse 16, For it is through Christ that the whole body of the church is able so to function that all its members are edified in love and preparation for salvation. In verse 17, Paul is saying, Let not the saints of God continue to walk after the manner of the world, those who have learned of Christ and his laws, who have turned from sin to righteousness, who have crucified the old man of sin and are now new creatures of the Holy Ghost, let them not give place again to the devil. Verses 18 and 19, Paul is saying, Some individuals have alienated themselves from God through refusing to look to God, being past feeling, and giving themselves over to lasciviousness or immoral desires. We must never get to the point of being past feeling and consciously ignoring serious consequences of sin. True religion is a feeling which is different than just emotions. It is common in anti-Mormon literature for attacks to be made on prayer and on trusting one's feelings as sources for obtaining truth. In the realm of spiritual understanding, both are fundamental. Truth is felt. Falsehood is often clothed in erudite and sophisticated arguments. One does not have to be able to refute the argument to know that it is false. Truth feels good. Falsehood does not. Christ spoke of the inability of the wicked to understand with their heart while the righteous understood in their hearts things too marvelous to utter. See, that has to do with our feelings, the seat of our emotions, our heart. Describing the spirit of revelation from Joseph Smith, the Lord said, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. Because of their wickedness, such understanding was lost to Nephi's rebellious brothers. Ephesians 4, 20 through 21. In verse 20, Paul is saying, How different are the believing Gentiles from the unbelieving? Believers must be aware of retaining anything of the vanity, ignorance, or impurity of the old heathen life. I'm sorry, believers must beware of retaining any of the vanity, ignorance, or impurity of the old heathen life. 
Verse 21, heard him, meaning he is not thinking of the possibility that some of them had heard Christ teach. They heard him in listening to the gospel, heard what he taught on earth. Ephesians 4, 22-24, putting off Christ, I'm sorry, putting off concerning the former conversation. Paul's counsel to putting off concerning the former conversation, the old man, and putting on the new man. Use the imagery of setting aside old clothing and clothing oneself in righteousness. Paul devoted much of the rest of emphasis describing the saints' former conversation, meaning the uprightness practices the saints should abandon. I'm sorry, meaning the unrighteous practices the saints should abandon, and defining the higher, more saintly manner of living they should adopt. Verse 22, the old man, meaning the natural man who is an enemy to God. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, and verses 31 through 32, can ye be angry and not sin? The Joseph Smith translation of Ephesians 4, 26 changes the confusing instruction. It says, be ye angry and sin not to the, to the question. Be ye angry and sin not to the question, can you be angry and not sin? This change brings this verse into harmony with Paul's other teachings about anger, such as his counsel to let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. When Paul wrote, let not a sun go down on your wrath, he was teaching the saints that they should not retire for the evening until they had overcome their angry thoughts. The Savior was similarly taught about anger as recorded in Matthew 5.22 and 35.12.22. Elder Lynn G. Robinson of the, tw of the 70 taught, A cunning part of Satan's strategy is to disassociate anger from agency, making us believe that we are victims of an emotion that we cannot control. When I hear, I lost my temper, Losing one's temper is an interesting choice of words that has become a widely used idiom. It, idiom. To lose something implies not meaning to, accidentally, involuntarily, not responsible, careless perhaps, but not responsible. He made me mad, this is another phrase we hear, also implies lack of control or agency. This is a myth that must be debunked. No one makes us mad. Others don't make us angry. There is no force involved. Become angry, becoming angry is a conscious choice, a decision. Therefore, we can make the choice not to become angry. We choose. End of quote. Ephesians 4.29, no corruptible communication. Paul encouraged the saints to avoid corrupt communication which included all forms of inappropriate speech, lying, deceit, vulgar or profane expressions, gossip, gossip irreverent or disrespectful speech, and offensive, corrupt, degrading, belittling, or profane language, among others. Ephesians chapter 5, Saints exhorted to avoid uncleanliness and walk uprightly. By way of introduction, Elder Bruce R. McConkie gives the following counsel. Ethical principles, godly conduct, personal righteousness, everything that is good and right, all such grow out of the gospel. Exhortations to walk in the light, to pursue a course leading to celestial peace, to keep the commandments, all such bear fruit when men know the doctrines of Christ. If there were no God, no gospel, no eternal life, men might as well eat, drink, be merry, and let lust and passion rule. But there is a God. He has ordained a gospel of salvation. The saints were foreordained to receive the plan of salvation. They are sealed by the Holy Spirit of pro promise. Salvation does come by grace through faith. The blood of Christ does save, redeem, and justify. The Gentiles are fellow heirs with Israel. There is one true church, apostles and prophets, guide us destiny, and give revelation to the saints and to the world, all of which Paul has already told the Ephesians with power and in plainness. Building on this foundation, the foundation of God and his 
apostles, Paul is now continuing his mighty exhortations, exhortations that change the lives of men who believe in Christ and his gospel. End of quoting Elder McConkie. Ephesians 5, verse 1, the phrase, be followers of Christ, meaning walk in the path he walked in, obey the laws he obeyed, do the things he did until you become perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect, until you become like him and have exaltation with him. God is the great prototype. Jesus is next. Joseph Smith taught, quote, what did Jesus do? Why? I do the things I saw my father do. My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same. That's Joseph quoting Jesus, so that Jesus treads in the tracks of his father. End of Joseph's quote. Ephesians 5.2, A Sweet Smelling Savor. Paul taught about how Christ had offered himself as an offering and a sacrifice, therefore becoming a sweet smelling savor. Elder Bruce Law McConkie taught, even as each sacrifice offered anciently, as it prefigured the coming sacrifice to the Lamb of God, was a sweet savor unto the Lord. Exodus twenty nine eighteen. So was Christ's offering of himself a pleasing thing to God. The sweet smell of the burning sacrifices in Israel, in Israel symbolized the pleasing blessings flowing from our Lord's personal offering. Ephesians 5, 3 through 7, avoiding uncleanliness. In a list of sins to watch out for, Paul warns against involvement in filthiness, in sexual conduct, foolish talking, and jesting. Verse 4, the last term anciently connotes connoted something even more negative than joking. It meant using polished and clever speech to accomplish evil purposes, similar to what the Book of Mormon calls flattery. Paul also issues a warning against being deceived by flattery. Thus, avoid being partakers of such things. In verse 5, Paul gives a specific warning, which is a little plainer to the reader from the Aramaic version of the New Testament. The Aramaic version says, quote, You should know this, that no one guilty of fornication, no, uncomplete, no unclean person, no covetous man who serves idols has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of his God, unquote. Ephesians 5, 8 through 21, verse 8, as saints in Christ's true church have come out of the darkness of the world and are now in the light of the Lord and his gospel, therefore act like the children of light. Verse 9, fruits of the spirit, meaning this comes from Galatians 5, 22, fruit of the light is right here in the gospel. 5.10, those who walk as children of light find out by experience what God's will is. Light is always a test. Verse 11, Paul is saying light has fruit. Verse 9, but, but darkness has only fruitless works. Compare Galatians 5.19-22. Rather, even expose them as light is sure to do. Verse 12, things so shameful ought not to be passed over. Verse 13, but all things, when they are exposed by the light, are made manifest. For whosoever is made manifest is light. Light turns darkness into light. This had happened to his readers. Verse 8. Verse 14, Paul is either quoting a lost scripture or giving a paraphrasing interpretation of Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 15, Look therefore carefully how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise as to your conduct that is according to the gospel. Verse 16, Redeeming, meaning buying up for yourselves the opportunity to make good use of your time. Verse 17, Wherefore, do not show yourself fools, but understand God's will for your lives. Verse 18, the phrase, Be not drunk with wine, meaning, Inasmuch as men drink of wine, or strong drink among you, behold, it is not good, neither meat in the sight of your father. Excess, meaning riotous living. 
not your bodies, but your souls should be full of the Spirit so that you can have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. Verse 19, use proper music to invite the Spirit into your life. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. That's from D.C. 25, 12. Chapter 5, verse 20, the phrase, giving thanks always. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, gave, save those who confess not his hand in all things, and obey not his commandments. D.C. 59, 21. And he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto him, even a hundredfold, yea, more. Doctrine and Covenant 78, 19. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord, that he may watch over you in your sleep. And when thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. And if you do these things, you shall be lifted up at the last day. Alma 37, 37. So modern scripture, backing up what Paul was trying to teach of giving thanks always. Chapter 5, verse 21, Paul was trying to say, but everything is to be done decently and in order. Enthusiasm is not to lead to anarchy. Paul ceaselessly preached submission or subjection to proper and or righteous authority. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, husband and wives love each other. These verses contain counsel on husband-wife relations. Wives are encouraged to submit to their husbands, just as the husband submits to the Lord. The, scripture, the scriptures use the term submit in various contexts. We should submit to each other. We should submit to government leaders. We should submit to Christ's or church leaders. And we should submit to the Lord. In other words, Paul is teaching accountability. Everyone is accountable to someone. Submitting to the will of God is a beautiful and sacred concept. God really does want our hearts, our obedience, our dedication, our loyalty, our allegiance. He wants us to turn from doing our own pleasure and submit to his will. Sanctif sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts to God, Helaman said in chapter 3, verse 35. In the same spirit of submission to God, the wife is counseled to submit to their husbands, certainly not in the sense of cowering servitude, but in the sense of honoring or respecting his leading role in their companionship and in their home. It is clear in the scriptures and in the present day church that if the husband himself is not honoring that role, the wife has no obligation to submit to his guidance. The patriarchal order of priesthood and the macho male chauvinist mentality are not the same. Wives are encouraged to follow the lead of their husbands in righteousness. Christ came to to serve. Husbands should do the same. Doctrine and Covenants 121 gives the most sublime and pointed description of the proper use of priesthood power in the home. Quoting 121, the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven, and the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. That they may be conferred upon us, it is true. But when we undertake to cover our sin, or to gratify our pride, our vain ambition, or to exercise control, or dominion, or compulsion upon others in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves, the Spirit of the Lord is grieved, and when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood authority of that man. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness, meekness, or by love unframed. Now, brothers and sisters, unless we make the grievous mistake that this is only to males, it refers to females, children, and anyone. 
anyone who tries to control others to cover their sins, to gratify their pride and their vain ambition and exercise dominion control upon others, amen to your authority to anything, regardless of what gender you are. With that kind of spiritual oper spirit operating in the home, no one would be abused. In the celestial covenant, both husband and wife must be committed to a celestial lifestyle and celestial attitudes. In verse 25, husbands are counseled to love their wives just as Christ loves his bride, the church. Men ought to love their wives as themselves. See verse 28. Both husband and wife should love and revere each other. Verse 33. The counsel is reciprocal. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, Happiness in marriage is not so much a matter of romance as it is an anxious concern for the comfort and well-being of one's companion. Any man who will make his wife's comfort his first concern will stay in love with her throughout their lives and throughout the eternity yet to come. Paul's counsel that wives should submit to their husbands in Ephesians 5.22 does, does not justify male domination. People in Greco-Roman society regarded the father as being the head of the extended family and the absolute authority over the entire household. Therefore, Paul's teachings represented a dramatic change to these traditional ideas because he defined husbands and fathers' roles in terms of Christ's love and sacrifice for the church. That was completely foreign to the crucial Roman cultural society. Paul declared that the manner in which Jesus Christ loved and sacrificed for the church was the ultimate example of how husbands should love and sacrifice for his wife. In our day, church leaders have taught that men are not to dominate family relationships, but by divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness. Spencer President Spencer W. Kimball explained, quote, A woman need not have fear of being imposed upon or of any dictatorial measures or of any improper demands when the husband is self-sacrificing and worthy. Husbands are commanded to love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ loved the church and its people so much that he voluntarily endured persecution for them, suffered humiliating indignities for them, stoically withstood pain and physical abuse for them, and finally gave his precious life for them. When the husband is ready to treat his household in that manner, not only the wife, but all the family will respond to his leadership. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught priesthood holders, quote, The wife you choose will be your equal. Paul declared, Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In the marriage companionship, there is neither inferiority nor superiority. The woman does not walk ahead of the man, neither does the man walk ahead of the woman. They walk side by side as a son and daughter of God on an eternal journey. She is not your servant, your chattel, or anything of that kind. I am confident that when we stand before the bar of God, there will be little mention of how much wealth we accumulated in life or of any honors which we may have achieved. But there will be searching questions concerning our domestic relations. And I am convinced that only those who have walked through life with love and respect and appreciation for their companions and children will receive from our eternal judge the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Brothers and sisters, as husband and wife, we walk side by side. Yes, the Father presides in the home. There has to be a head, just that there is a head of Christ who is Heavenly Father. There is accountability. But we, you walk side by side in performing the duties and responsibilities of your home and doing it submitting to the will of the Father. 
Chapter 6, putting on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, honor thy father and mother. As part of his counsel on the family relations, Paul reiterated the commandment that children should honor their parents. And for the strength of the youth, church leaders identify some ways children can do this. Honor your parents by showing love and respect for them. Obey them as they lead you in righteousness. Remember, no one is under obligation to follow anyone in unrighteousness. Children, you are not required to follow and obey your parents in unrighteousness. But you can still honor and respect them. Willingly help in the home. Participate in wholesome family activities and traditions. Join in family and family prayer, family scripture study, and family homing. Keeping these commandments strengthens and unifies families. Ephesians 6, four. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Paul admonished parents to bring up their children in the admonition of the Lord. Modern scriptures provide specific instructions about the responsibilities parents have to raise their children up to the Lord, including helping children to develop faith. See specifically Doctrine Covenant 68, 25 through 28, section 93, verse 40, and Moses 6, 57 through 60. Elder Kevin W. P. Pearson of the 70 taught why parents should help children develop faith in Christ. Quote, As parents, we have been commanded to teach our children to understand the doctrine of faith in Christ, the Son of the living God. There is no other thing on which we can have absolute assurance. There is no other foundation on life that can bring the same peace, joy, and hope. In uncertain and difficult times, faith is truly a spiritual gift worthy of our utmost efforts. We can give our children education, lessons, athletics, the arts, and material possessions. But if we do not give them faith in Christ, we have given them little. Ephesians 6, 5-9 Masters and slaves, kings and peasants, lords and vassals, all men, regardless of rank, caste, or social and economic status, are saved on the same terms and conditions. Every man shall be stripped of all rank and worldly honor in that day when the Lord shall come to recompense unto every man according to his work, and measure to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow man. DNC 110. Verses 5-8, through The Servant's were slaves. The social structure which kept them in bondage was outside the power of the Ephesian saints to overthrow. The church was not in a position to overthrow the government. It has to work within the culture and the government. So Paul thus has no alternative but to recognize their state and counsel them how to live under it. Slavery as such, in fact, abhorred is in fact abhorrent to gospel standards. It is not right. The Lord says that any man should be in bondage one to another. Verse 6, doing the will of God meant keeping the commandments. Verse 7, doing service, laboring honestly and diligently. As to the Lord, meaning service rendered others, should be performed as though for the Lord. The New Testament times, slavery was a very common institution throughout the Roman Empire. Undoubtedly, many church members were either servants or had servants or part of their household. People became slaves by being captured in war, being sold to pay debts, or being kidnapped. Paul's counsel about how servants should act does not imply that he approved of the institution of slavery, but it teaches members of the church living in a culture with servants and masters, household relationships should be guided by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 9 of chapter 6, masters, like husbands and parents, have their obligations. They also must have good temper and goodwill and be God-fearing. Paul does not tell them to emancipate their slaves, but he tells them to love them as brethren. This does not free the slave, but it frees slavery of its evils. Paul likewise enjoined a lofty standard upon employees. We may take this to mean in modern terms that the servant and employee should constantly give honest service, full and complete, and do for the employer what he would want an employee to do for him if he himself were the employer. Ephesians 10, 6, I'm sorry, verses 10 through 18, put on the whole armor of God. 
As he taught his readers how to defend themselves against spiritual wickedness, Paul drew upon the imagery of a soldier wearing armor. Paul listed the parts of a soldier's gear in the order a soldier would put them on or take them in hand. Symbolically, this showed how the gospel protects a person's overall spiritual soundness, including one's thoughts, intellect, feelings, and moral purity. The following chart lists the pieces of armor that Paul identified and what they might represent today. Verse 14. The armor was a belt or a girt tied around the waist. This represented truth. It, it re protected the loins. The loins represented those organs in our body that create children through our chastity and our moral purity. Be girded in truth about charity and about creating children and that using the ability to create children should only be done within the bonds of marriage. In verse 14, he said, have a breastplate made of bronze or chain. Our, the armor represented righteousness, uprightness with God. It protected the heart. It represented our affections, our emotions, loyalty. Verse 15, boots, rugged shoes, shotted, studded with nails or traction. It represented preparation of the gospel of peace, and it protected the feet. feet. It represented our course in life, our actions, places we go, our goals. Our feet represent the things we are doing. Verse 16, have a shield, large oval made of two layers of wool held together with iron and leather. It represented faith. It protected the entire body. And it may represent our whole soul. Verse 17, we are to have the helmet made of bronze with leather straps. That armor re represented salvation and it protected the heads, which represented our thoughts, our intellect. In verse 17, we should have a sword, weapon made of steel. And this is the only weapon that is listed. It represented the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is the sword, the sword of the Spirit. It was to protect the entire body, and it protected the part of the body, our whole soul. May we put on the armor of God daily, or we will be overcome by the whirlwinds and the fiery darts of the evil one. Robert, Ella Robert C. Oaks of the Sunday observed that these weapons are used in the battle for souls. Quote, the weapons of eternal worth reflecting the whole armor of God are truth, righteousness, faith, prayer, and the word of God. These weapons are wielded in our minds, mouths, and movements. Every righteous thought, word, and deed is a victory for the Lord. The stakes are extremely high. The prizes are the very souls of the sons and daughters of God, their eternal salvation. And these souls will be won or lost on the basis of virtue and cleanliness, on the basis of chastity and service, on the basis of faith and hope. End of quote. Ephesians 6, verse 16, the shield of faith. Paul taught that the shield of faith can deflect attacks by the adversary and quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, Ephesians 6, 16. President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught about the importance of the family in forging a shield of faith. The shield of faith, quote, quote the shield of faith is to be made and fitted in the family. No two can be exactly alike. Each must be handcrafted to individual specifications. The plan designed by the Father contemplates that man and woman, husband and wife, working together, fit each child individually with a shield of faith made to buckle on so firmly that it can neither be pulled off nor penetrated by those fiery darts. It takes the steady strength of a father to hammer out the metal of it and the tender hands of a mother to polish and fit it on. Sometimes one parent is left to do it alone. It is difficult, but it can be done. In the church, we can teach about the materials from which a shield of faith is made. Reverence, courage, chastity, repentance, forgiveness, compassion. 
In church, we can learn how to assemble and fit them together, but the actual making and fitting of the shield of faith belongs in the family circle, end of quote. Brothers and sisters, as famously quoted by President David O. McKay, there will be no success. No success can be compensated for failure in the home. We must do these things in the home. It is not to be done by the church. Ephesians 6, verse 19, the mystery of the gospel. Paul is saying the gospel and all things pertaining to it are beyond human comprehension. Unless and until men's souls are touched by the Spirit of God, true religion is a thing of the Spirit, not of the intellect, and it can only be known and understood by the power of the Spirit. To the carnal mind, it is and ever shall be a mystery. Ephesians 6.24, sincerity. It is doubtful whether the Greek can mean this can mean this better meaning is incorruption or incorruptibility. It is those who love with an imperishable love that are meant. There must be neither decrease nor decay. Those who were chosen in him before the foundation of the world retain their love for him undiminished after the world itself has passed away. Brothers and sisters, may we put on Christ daily. May we cleave unto Christ. May we come unto him, prophesy and speak of him, and be unweary in well-doing and in submitting to the will of Christ. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoy the presentation, hit the like button.